let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and daughters sing. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to the Ah, you may be seated and good morning. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Thank you for being here. I don't know. There's a box here. I'm just going to move it in case it needs to be there. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being who you are and being a part of this congregation and uh, being part of this service today. Uh, we're just so grateful to have you here. We're grateful to be able to serve you, to be able to serve serve with you in the name of the Lord. And uh, man, this is uh, this is my favorite time of year. I'm one of those jerks. Uh, I know it's getting a little colder. The days are a little shorter, but uh, man, those sunrises are next level, and especially with the snow on the mountains makes me breathe a little easier and I'm constantly just reminded my parents have my parents have been visiting down here for about a month and uh, well my dad off and on and uh, my dad just keeps saying he's like you got so lucky with where you landed and my wife and I just keep going we know we know we sure love it here and I was telling my dad it's I've been here almost seven years now and it's home this is the second longest I've ever lived anywhere in my life and uh, man we, we are grateful to be Central Oregonians, and it's mostly comes down to, to you all. The mountains also help, but it's mostly you guys. Uh, if you're new with us today, uh, we just want to let you know that we have communion offering for those of you who are wanting to take communion. <coughs> They're located strategically around the room by the lamps, uh, also next to our offering boxes and Bibles. So feel free to uh, grab communion. If you don't, this is important. We're ordering more, so don't feel bad that there's not as many as there were. If you don't have a Bible, please take a Bible for you to keep, for you to study. That's why we got them. That's why they're there. They're there for for you to use and study. So feel free to take one of those. Um, Yeah. And if you have questions or thoughts or concerns, prayer requests, praises, or anything like that, the cards in the seat back in front of you, feel free to fill those out. The QR codes that are around the church, you can scan those and it'll get you all the same information. Uh, But I don't want to take up any more of your time right now, because I feel like worshiping the Lord. So why don't we get right back to it? Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, Especially this week, as we dwell on thankfulness, on gratitude, I'm grateful for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord. At the same time, I praise you for the hard things that we have to go through. Because sometimes the adversity is what shows us our allies, our adversities are what show us how good you are. And Lord, though uh, many times we wish we didn't have to, to deal with them, I pray for specifically me, Lord, I would just pray for the mindset to conquer them in your name, the giants that have already been vanquished, and for your glory. But Father, as we just enter this Thanksgiving and Christmas season, may we dwell wholeheartedly on you. May it set the tone for a new year and not just a new year, but a new life. We love you, Father. May we praise you with everything we have. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, would you stand with us for the first uh, couple songs today? The marketplace is empty. No more traffic. All the builders' tools are silent No more time to harvest wheat Busy housewives cease 
Mr. Labor in the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. The king is coming, the king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. something to look forward to or what this kind of goes right along with it some glad morning when this life is over I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore Oh, 
scripture for us. Good morning and happy Thanksgiving. You know, in trying to pick out a, a scripture for Thanksgiving, this, it's a funny scripture to be thinking about Thanksgiving, but I just thought, oh, yeah, it is. And w- we got to teach this to our kids at Awanas this last week, and it was so fun teaching about David. So anyway, it's Psalms 23, is what you, which all of you know it. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. That means we don't need anything. He's given it all, and we can be thankful for that. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Oh, he leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. I mean, what more do we have to be thankful for then? We have everything we want. We have water to drink for our bodies and water for our souls and and in the message which you guys know I love God my shepherd isn't that cool he's our shepherd I don't need a thing you have bedded me down in lush meadows you find me quiet pools to drink from and let me catch my breath so Psalms 23 is a thankful psalm Thank you, Pam Lundy. You've all heard of the message. That was the Pam Lundy version. And and I love the excitement that she brings. Thank you, dear. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came.
And because he lives, we should be so thankful for that. In this particular season, we should be thankful for everything that God has done for us. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. everyone. As was mentioned earlier, we will be taking a communion today, this morning, and if you haven't received your elements, uh, you can pick them up now. They're at various stations around the perimeter of the uh, auditorium. 
I hope you'll uh, permit me to just do a little reading this morning. The year that is drawing to a close has been, the, has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are, are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. No human counsel has devised nor has any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the precious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in, in his anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed fit to me and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are so sojourning in foreign lands <clears throat> to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens. And I recommend to them also that while offering up the ascriptions justly do him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore, implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In testimony whereof, I have heretofore set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. <clears throat> Done at the city of Washington this third day of October in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th. Of course, President Lincoln wrote that 160 years ago. That's part of his uh, well-known Thanksgiving proclamation, or at least that's a part of it. And in that, he acknowledged the blessings that God has given us of the earth and of the sky, and those are certainly worth mentioning and worth celebrating and worth being thankful for. But he failed to mention that of God's greatest blessing, and that is of Jesus, our Messiah, because only he can heal our wounds and restore peace and harmony to this nation and to the world, and that only after he returns. Until then, we will have increasing chaos and increasing anarchy, but a new world is coming, a world that has been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. By taking these elements this morning, we demonstrate our participation in the kingdom of God now as we wait for the fullness of that kingdom, that wonderful kingdom that is yet to come. So let's give thanks this morning. Our holy and living and awesome God, those words penned by our president 160 years ago are still very, very relevant today. And if those individuals there were disobedient and abhorrent in your sight, how much more we are today. We humbly ask your forgiveness of our personal and national sins and all the times that we have gone against your will and decided that we have known better. But of course we have not. And for we in the church, my prayer is that we, you would continue to purify our lives so that the difference, the separation between us and the world becomes ever more apparent. So to you this morning, great God, 
We give you our praise, our thanksgiving, our worship as the one who is the great giver. And every good and perfect gifts comes from the God who is on higher, in which there is no shadow, no variables, but only truth. We pray this gratefully, humbly, in the name of your Son, our Savior, our living Savior, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Pastor Brian would have come up here, uh, and yet um, Brian is at, uh, at the hospital, not for himself, but for Grandma, uh, Grandma Vi, who he had come out to visit uh, uh, through Thanksgiving, and so we, uh, we want to keep our prayers with uh, Brian and Miranda and their family, and for uh, Grandma Vi, uh, she just has not been able to uh, stand up very well and walk very well before weakness uh, begins to, to happen, so uh, we want to continue to just lift them up. Uh, some things going on in, our, uh, in the life of our congregation in the next month and a half or so. Uh, first of all, um, and, and so Elizabeth, I'm going to need you to actually help me out by uh, going to each one of those um, slides um, that say, uh, coming events. Uh, and there's, yeah, thank you. So what's the first one, Elizabeth? Elizabeth gets to dictate what we do here today. That's good. Uh, tonight, men's ministry. We're, we're going to be gathering together in the fellowship hall at 5 o'clock, and we're going to be uh, watching a, a, a football game. Um, there's going to be a testimony uh, that is going to be shared during the uh, halftime. So we kind of turn off the TV and we listen to that, to how God has been working in people's lives. Uh, bring your favorite game day snack, and we will watch the Vikings uh, cream the, uh, the, uh, the Broncos. Um, and that'll be a good thing. Second of all, Elizabeth's going to show us, oh, Road to Bethlehem. Well, th this is actually our drive through nativity, our living nativity. Um, we will ha actually have, uh, this is what I'm going to need you to do during my sermon. If you could, while I, don't, don't listen to my sermon this time, um, I need you to go and make a, a, a sign-up list for people to sign up to, to be a part of the, the living nativity. Uh, you could put uh, uh, pre-activity, uh, you could put actors, you could put food, you could do cleanup. So four categories. Uh, this is our gift to the community. Every year for the last 10 years, we have, uh, nine or 10 years, we have been uh, doing this drive through nativity where we are put uh, people out uh, in different stations around our campus. Uh, people drive through and they see the uh, biblical story of uh, the nativity, Jesus' birth. And there's shepherds and there's sheep and then there's uh, magi and there's Mary and there's babies and it's, it's an amazing, donkeys. Um, so uh, as you leave today, make sure you sign up. It, it takes really a lot of us to do this. Uh, and when we say 
actors. All it means is that you're going to be standing out there with a bunch of cool people talking and laughing. And then when a car comes by, you pretend like you're a statue, let them go by, and then you can start talking and drinking your coffee or hot chocolate again. It's a great time, especially if you've never been involved in any of the ministries of our church. I have found that this is a great way for you to plug in and say, yeah, I'll, I'll play Mary. I'll play Gabriel. I'll play Joseph, whatever. I'll, I'll be a wise guy. And, uh, and it, it'll be nice. Uh, we're going to do that on the, sixth, uh, on the 9th of December. And that's a free thing for any of our uh, community members to come through and our, our church as well. Next, uh, Elizabeth, we've got uh, the piano. Uh, it used to be called the piano concert, but I hate performing on the piano. So I like you guys all sing with me. So it's called now a sing-along. So it's, it's a piano Christmas sing-along. That's going to be on the 16th at 6 o'clock over in the Fellowship Hall in the historic chapel. Uh, just the songs of the season, sounds of the season, you can come on in. I'm playing the piano. We're all singing great Christmas songs. And it's a, it's a fun time for all. There'll be dessert afterwards. Uh, if, you, if you bring cookies and stuff, there will be dessert. If you don't, then there won't be. Because I'm playing. That's all I'm doing. Next slide uh, is, uh, oh, our Christmas Eve service. So Christmas Eve this year is on Sunday. Well, normally we would have on a Sunday three services, and on Christmas Eve we would have two evening services. Well, uh, one of them being a Christmas pageant for the kiddos. Um, uh, the kiddos are involved. It's for our entire congregation, but they're a big part of that. And one it was just a, a candlelight communion service. Uh, well, this year, because... Uh, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. We're only going to do those last two services, but one of them is going to be in the morning at 9.30. That's going to be the one that incorporates children. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful program that DC and Pam have written every year, and, and kids get involved, and it's uh, wonderful songs uh, that we get to sing hymns, uh, Christmas songs. And then at 6 o'clock that evening, if you want to come back, or if that's the one you want to go to, that will be our communion uh, uh, candlelight service uh, with, a, uh, with a brief message and um, some singing as well. So that's coming up this year. Uh, make note of that so that you can either be here at the 9.30 time or the 6 o'clock time or, or both. I believe that was it. So let's have the lights on and let's make sure that we find people and, and greet them in the name of the Lord. Uh, make them feel welcome here. And then we're going to be having a, a go moment. Um, Uh-oh. And there goes the computer. Just turn it off and turn it on. And we just crashed, so I don't know if we'll have your slides up or not. If they get the computer up and running, then we got them. Or Tad. Oh, I get to be the bad guy today. Stop talking to each other. We don't need to fellowship. Just kidding. 
I get to talk to you guys about exciting things, though. I don't know, I'm waiting for Steve Prophet to say something snarky. Hi, buddy. Uh, so I have the privilege of talking to you guys this morning a little bit about, oh, uh, look at that. We stalled just long enough. Uh, but I have the privilege of talking to you about something that I, I deeply love, something that's uh, become a very important part of my life and my ministry in the last uh, six years or so, uh, and that's Mission for Mexico. And Mission for Mexico is a, a ministry that is uh, ingrained in the fabric of this congregation. Uh, it is a mission that takes students uh, from ninth grade and above down to Mexico, uh, San Luis, Rio, Colorado, literally just the church is like five blocks from the border, right over the border uh, from Yuma, Arizona, and to a church that we planted, this church helped plant over uh, 22, 24 years ago, 24 years ago, um, in a community that there was no community at that time. You could see the border from the church, and now it's a sprawling city that has grown up all around this church, a community that has exploded. And um, we get to build homes for people who don't have homes at all, who or don't have ones that are um, really fit to be living in. And this year, we, we have the privilege of building uh, two homes for two different families uh, with the possibility of a third and, um, and a special project, which I'll be talking about later. But the general mission for Mexico information is this. We have registration forms. They're, they'll be out at the Welcome Center. Uh, you can come chat with me after service if you'd like. The dates of the trip are March 22nd, which is the Friday before spring break, through March 31st, which is, fun fact, Easter Sunday. Um, so we get back on Resurrection Sunday, which is exciting. Um, oh, I didn't pick good colors for that, sorry. Um, it is a 10-day trip where we drive down to Mexico. We fellowship with the people from different churches, um, from uh, Sandy, from Pendleton, from all different areas of Oregon. We have a couple new churches that are joining up with us. And for students who are in ninth grade or above. And it is, uh, for my thoughts, one of the most impactful things that you can do as a believer is to go somewhere and be the hands and feet of Christ. Uh, you can, you know, I always say there's almost nothing that I can think of that is more of a blessing than to provide shelter for somebody who is without or who is without proper shelter. And the families that we're building for have children who are working hard to go through school, who are working hard to help support the family. And uh, they've done all the right things, and we're just going to try and help them get over the finish line by putting up those walls and that roof and giving them a safe place to lay their head and to build a foundation for their family. Um, so we go down to bless people. But everybody who's ever been on a mission trip at any point will always tell you we go to bless people, but we return ultimately infinitely more blessed than the people that we gifted. It is the mission of the church. That's why we call it mission work. And so if you have a student who's a ninth grader or above, or if you yourself, adults are totally welcome to join us, would like to go down to Mexico to help us build homes, uh, come speak with me. Uh, like I said, the dates are March 22nd through the 31st. The total cost of the trip is $1,200. Um, and we will be doing fundraisers, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, registration forms and $200 deposits are due by December 15th. Uh, if you have a student who's going who is under 18, this is very, 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 very important because it often gets forgotten. Uh, the form must be notarized with both parents signing in the presence of a notary because then we can take your kids into Mexico and, and get them back. If it's not notarized, we could probably get them over, but we'll have to get creative on the way back. Um, but if you have any questions about the trip in general, please feel free to ask me. And like I said, the, co the cost has gone up to $1,200 a year or for the trip. And it is a, that is a large amount of money. You don't have to tell me. Um, but before we made that decision, we made that decision based off of the cost of materials, fuel, and, and all the things that go into a trip like this. Uh, 
Mission from Mexico compared to other missions of similar length and style is still about a quarter of the price of most of the others. It's an incredible, it's an incredible trip and we do everything that we can to make sure that it's accessible for everybody. And one of those things that we do is fundraising. And we've talked a lot lately about cans and bottles. So if you have cans and bottles at your home and would like to turn them in to support Mission for Mexico, we have blue bags out there with the stickers. Um, you can ask me questions about that. We're also working on clearing out the silo. Um, fun fact, uh, Bottle Drop is a government entity. And government entities are super fun to work with. <laughs> Notoriously really good at getting back to you. Um, but even more exciting is we will be doing a large fundraising dinner uh, at the beginning of January, January 6th. It'll be a taco feed where anybody who's going on the Mission for Mexico trip will be there to help serve. We will have uh, presentations. Pastor Brian and I are working on possibly like an auction, things like that, to help raise money to lower the cost and lower the burden on people who are going. Um, and then we also have fundraising form letters this has always worked really well. This is something I'm uncomfortable with. I don't like talking about money, asking for money. Makes me itchy. Um, but we have fundraising letters where the students can, can fill out a form letter or write their own, which I always encourage, saying, hey, I have the opportunity to go on this mission trip to do these things. I think it's going to impact me in this way. Do you think you might be able to help me out? And send it to friends and family. You know, maybe they send twenty dollars, but that's twenty dollars you don't have to worry about. Uh, maybe they send a hundred dollars, and praise the Lord, all of it, every a little bit helps. It all adds up. Um, so if you want to go, but you think money's going to be an issue, don't. Talk with me. We'll figure it out. We'll find a way to get you there. Money's never going to be the reason that you get left out of an opportunity to serve the kingdom. Um, and the final thing, Elizabeth, Pastor Trey distracted you. Uh, the final thing is that we, as a church, uh, are helping out with a special project down in Mexico this year. There's a church that has been tied um, with the church that we planted for many years that uh, took a really bold step this last year. It's a very small church. I tried to get pictures, but I couldn't in time. This church is literally 12 feet wide. I'm not good at spatial awareness. So, like, maybe as wide from there to there... Don't, don't shoot me if I'm wrong. Maybe smaller. And it's about uh, 35 feet long. It's 12 by 35. There's enough for a tiny stage that's probably the size of this little outcropping right here and about eight pews. It's a small church that was kind of dying. And their leadership there um, made a bold choice because they noticed that there was a lot of youth in their community that weren't going to church, weren't getting the gospel. And so their leadership, their pastor and his family, 11 by 40, that's close, um, made the bold decision to focus on the youth of their community because they saw that there was a need for the gospel in that demographic, um, which speaks to me, uh, obviously. And because of that, a large number of their small congregation left. They were outraged that they would focus on a demographic that probably couldn't and wouldn't support the church. But because they did that, their congregation has gone from about eight people to weekly about 50. And a lot of them are these, the youth that they've been reaching out to. And they do incredible things. They feed these youth every weekend. They have, act, they have fun and safe activities on a regular basis so that the, the community youth can come in, watch a movie, hang out, play games, and not be in the streets, not be running around with the wrong crowd. They're really trying to invest in the next generation. And, uh, but they, like, like they said, they knew they were going to hit hard times when congregation members left. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down there and we're going to help them build an addition for that church, which is almost going to triple in size. It's about the same size as one of the houses we typically build. And we're adding on to their church so that they'll have room to put in a, a kitchen so they don't have to cook outdoors so that they can have a larger worship center a stage where they can perform worship and preach from, where they can welcome the community in for movie nights, for game nights, for all kinds of things, and, uh, and bless that congregation. Because I'm all about standing with churches who are taking bold steps in the name of Jesus Christ. And that, that uh, project itself is going to cost about the same as building a home. 
in Mexico, and it's about a $13,000 cost, which again, not an insignificant amount of money. But um, we at the meeting discussed, and we agreed that we thought that this was such a, a, a vital and important project for a church that's trying to do big things for the kingdom and bless a community that we, we decided that we would step up and we would figure out a way to finance that project. So if you have questions about that, if you have thoughts about it, if you have people that you'd like to point my way, please do so. Um, but I'll be out in the hallway and would love to talk to you about all things Mission from Mexico afterwards. But I'm going to pray and Pastor Trey's going to come up and, and give you his sermon. Thank you for listening to my ramblings and I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Father God, thank you for... Uh, Thank you for this day. Thank you for worship. Thank you for fellowship. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Father, thank you for Mission for Mexico and the work that you continue to do. Thank you for uh, helping us come back after COVID and just the thriving ministry that it's becoming once more. Thank you for all the new, uh, new folks that have come on board with the mission, the new churches that are joining on, and just the many, many, many lives, Father, that will be touched by this trip, by your spirit. I pray for the, uh, the families that we will be building for, that you're preparing their hearts to receive this blessing. For the people who are going on the trip to Mission for Mexico that know about it and the ones that maybe you haven't revealed that to yet. Father, I just pray that you would bless them, be with them, and uh, prepare the way for us. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. each piece of candy and wrap it in one of these papers and then put it back on the belt. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. ma'am. <laughs> Let her roll! <laughs> I thought you were downstairs boxing chocolates. Oh, they kicked me out of there fast. Why? I kept pinching them to see what kind they were. <laughs> this is the fourth department I've been in. Oh, I didn't do so well either. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. And thus the holidays come right at us. Amen? Why I show that is because that clip makes me tired. I just, 
I, I've been in jobs like that where you just have to try to keep up with the pace that's coming in. Now, what's worse is I've also seen people approach their spiritual lives like that, where they think that God is like that lady. Roll, start rolling them out. And if you, if you don't get all of these things right as it's coming at you, then you're fired. People see God like that, and they see their religious duties like those chocolates coming at them. And, and, and we feel like there's so much pressure that if we mess up, then we're out. Today, I hope, in the, uh, the few minutes that we have left remaining, to, I hope to clear up the air of what God has called you and I to do as believers, the life that he has called us. It might surprise you what God does not require of you. Back, back in Hebrews chapter 2, the author of this letter encourages the reader to not neglect what he terms the great salvation found in Jesus I want to pause there for a minute before we go to Hebrews chapter 4. You'll take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 4 today. But let me just ask you, have you ever pondered what makes the salvation that you and I enjoy in Jesus? What makes that so great? I mean, the the author calls it such a great salvation. Well, what makes it great? Is it it because it was free? I love free. That's what makes it great. Sure. Is it uh, that I don't have to spend eternity away from my God, that makes it pretty great as well. Could there be something more about our salvation that makes it great? Have you ever spent time thinking about what it means when you say that you're saved? You know, pe- people talk about being saved all the time. You know, I'm fascinated by the uh, biblical idea, the New Testament idea of being saved. If I were to go back to school to get my next degree, I, I think I would want to write my thesis on. Um, what salvation is all about, according to the Bible writers. People talk about being saved all the time. But were you aware, for example, that the New Testament actually speaks of three distinct realities that are all referred to as being saved? First of all, there's the point of conversion, or the, the, the Bible word is justification. That, that's when somebody professes a faith in Jesus, accepting him into their life and saying that he is the son of God who died for their sins. That's typically what people mean when they say, hey, uh, when were you saved? That they want to know that point in time that you were justified and forgiven of all your sin. Um, and, and there are several places in scripture uh, that, that would tell you uh, those places that that word saved uh, it, it refers to. But then there's a second uh, category, if you will, reality of being saved. The Bible uses that same word when it speaks of the process of becoming less like the world, less like our old sinful self, and more like Jesus. And that's known as sanctification. So we have justification, then we have sanctification. And you see, if you're writing down your notes, some of the examples of when the New Testament talks about being saved as being a process of becoming more and more like Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, in the New Testament, you'll also read that word saved, uh, speaking of salvation as the moment that you step from this life into the next, when you get to go to heaven. And that's then glorification, and you'll see there some examples uh, uh, there uh, in, in the New Testament of when the New Testament writers are talking about glorification. So all three of these are are part of being saved, past, present, future. So here's the rhetorical question. When the author of Hebrews is saying, you have such a great salvation, don't neglect that. Well, which one of these is he talking about? Is he talking about justification? Is he talking about sanctification? Is he talking about glorification? Or possibly could he be referring to all three? You know, what's more, you start to read in the New Testament other concepts of being connected with being saved, and you'll see other terms like redeemed, being bought back, uh, adopted, entering into God's family, reconciled, being made right, and the hostility between us and God now gone. These are all part of a great salvation, aren't they? 
And then you begin to look at all the blessings that come from being saved. Yes, uh, there, there is peace with God. There is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There is a hope for eternal life in heaven. There is the knowledge that your sins have all been forgiven. There is this idea that you are being made like Jesus. All of these are blessings that come from being saved. And then the author of Hebrews brings up one more, and this is what we're looking at today in chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. So if you've got your Bibles there, we're talking about rest. Rest. The rest that God offers us through this great salvation. Now, one scripture to bear in mind before I read Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Uh, It comes from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 11, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Now that rest that Jesus is speaking of is the focus of this next section of Hebrews. So let's read the text together and then see what we can glean from it. Hebrews 4. Therefore, there it is again, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as it did to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest as he has said, as I swore in my rest, they shall never enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he says, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works just as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. This is one of those complex passages that reflect a rabbinical mindset. What I hope to do today is give you a broad paint stroke rather than detail um, explanations of things. But we begin with the word therefore. In fact, therefore is in there three times. Therefore, you got to ask what the therefore is there for. So you got to connect it back to what he just talked about in chapter 3. Last week we learned that uh, the, the Jews of Moses' day did not enter into the promised land because they hardened their hearts. And you had an entire generation who had been brought out of slavery, but who died in the wilderness. God did not allow them to go into the promised land. That promised land, by the way, and this is what I want you to understand, that promised land was a gift. They did nothing to earn that land. God was giving it to them as a gift. But they still had the responsibility to actually go in to the land and take it uh, through faith in the power of God. But what happened? Well, the people rebelled. Uh, and, and they said, we don't want to go into the promised land. So God said, fine, you'll die here in the, in the wilderness Anybody 20 years old and up, that entire generation will die. You won't get to go into the promised land. And he swore that in his wrath, which is righteous anger, by the way. He swore that they would die in the wilderness rather than receive that gift that he had promised. Which brings up the question, what is the rest that God is promising us? Whatever it is, it's pretty important because the author of Hebrews says, pay attention. While the promise of entering his rest still stands, Hebrews 4.1, let us fear. Let us fear. Let us be very cautious about this, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach the promise, the promised rest. Now, again, here's, here's the thing that blows my mind. The author of Hebrews is not writing to unbelievers. He's not telling unbelievers, oh, watch out. You may be separated from God forever. He's speaking to believers. Believers who had already said, we want to follow after Jesus. Verse 2 is clear. He says, the good news came to us. He's talking about people who had heard the good news and who had accepted the good news. They are believers. 
But then he says, we have to pay attention to what happened there in that first generation. Because just because you were one of the elect in Moses' day did not automatically mean you had a guaranteed spot waiting for you in the predestined promised land. It is possible for people to make an initial response to God's call and then choose to walk away. No, you cannot ever be taken away. The devil can't take you away. You are secure in that. No, no sin that you commit is so great that God cannot forgive it. But you can walk away. This is really what Jesus meant in his parable when he talks about this, the, the, the seed of the word of God falling on the different soils. He says there are going to be some people who receive the good news with joy, but either because they have shallow roots or because they had not separated themselves from the thorns of this world, they do not produce. They do not grow into fruitfulness and they die away. And that's what the first generation out of Egypt was, was like. Believers who didn't really believe. So there is this dire warning. Be afraid. Be afraid because it could happen again. Be careful lest you become apathetic, um, indifferent, and eventually your hearts become hard and you fail to embrace God's promised rest. What does this look like? Well, some, of, some people have been in church virtually their entire lives. They assume that they're okay because they go to church, because they're Americans, because they have a heritage of faith, right? But a wise man once said a long time ago, thinking that going to church makes you a Christian is about as silly as thinking that being in, in a McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. Yeah, you find Big Macs at McDonald's, you find Christians at church, but just because you're here doesn't mean that you're really here. See, the gospel message is not just about giving you a free ticket to heaven. There is that. Don't get me wrong. But there are, as we mentioned a moment ago, a lot of blessings that God wants to give to us through the gospel. And yet, according to the last part of verse 2, that Exodus generation did not receive any of those benefits. Well, okay, they weren't slaves anymore. That was a good thing. But they had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, never receiving the, the gift that God wanted to give them. Every single one of them, 20 years old and up, would die there in the desert, never entering into the promised land. Realization of God's free gift to us hinges on our accepting it in faith. But it needs to be a faith that compels us to follow. Otherwise, we're just going to stay in the wilderness. Ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo. And God goes, I want you to keep going. Keep, I, want, I want to give you this rest. And we're going, well, I don't, I'm not sure I want to go there. We have to follow. We have to have a faith that doesn't just say intellectually, I believe that there is a God and that Jesus is his son and he died for my sins. Yay, that's all I need to do. Congratulations, you've come up out of Egypt but you have not yet made it into the promised land because you're not following in faith. God continues to call us to take hold of his promises through faith, which is demonstrated through our actions. So in order for us to make sense of this rest that the author is speaking of, and remembering that we have to kind of keep a rabbinical mindset, we should take note that there's not just one reality of rest in Scripture. The, the first mention of rest is found in Genesis chapter 2. In the creation account, in Genesis chapter 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. Here God is resting. That's the first time we see the word rest in Scripture. He is resting after his work of creation. The, the author of Hebrews alludes to this in, in the last part of verse 3 and 4 where he says his works were finished from the foundation of the world. He was done. For he has spoken somewhere of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. So God's first Sabbath rest is that first reality that we read of in Scripture about the Sabbath rest. The second instance is when he then commands through Moses that his people take a Sabbath rest once a week. You labor for six days, and then you rest for one. That's in, in Exodus chapter 20. 
to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. On it you shall rest and not do any work. Again, guys, that seventh day of rest is a gift from God. It really is. Otherwise, on our own, I know many of us would just work ourselves to death. Jesus told us that actually God made the Sabbath to serve man, not man to serve the Sabbath. God gave us this gift of the Sabbath to be able to take regular breaks to rest from our busy lives. How many of us, though, live our lives like Lucy and Ethel there with the chocolates just coming at us and coming at us and coming at us, coming at us and coming at us and coming at us? God says, take a break. It's a gift from me to you. The third reality of the Sabbath then comes after Moses' uh, time. He, he passes away, and now the, the people of God, this next generation, are being led finally into the promised land. Joshua is their leader. The Sabbath rest that we read of in Joshua is more about geography this time than anything, because God actually calls the land, the promised land, their rest. Joshua 21, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land, that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it. They settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one uh, word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass." The rest that the Lord was giving to his people there was the possession of the land. It was, that, it was that rest that the Exodus generation, they missed out on. They refused to go into the land that is being fought for even today. Again, for the Jews to stay there in Israel. Now, some people would think then, okay, great. They, they were able to go into the land. That's it. That's the Sabbath rest that God had in store. But not so. Because... Last week, King David in Psalm 95 says, no, 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 there's something else today if you hear his voice. Don't rely on the past, what God did in the past. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as in Meribah and Masa, when the the, the people put me to to the test. Uh, Because if you do, you will not enter into my rest. So therefore, there's another rest coming. David understood that there was a rest that was going to come after Moses and Joshua. The author of Hebrews picks up on this in verse 7. He says, again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David in the words already quoted, for if Joshua had given them rest, if that was the, the, the ultimate, the climax of what God was doing was just to bring his people into the promised land, if that was the rest, then God would not have spoken of another day through David in Psalm 95 later on. To the author of Hebrews, it is the appearance of Jesus speaking now a complete revelation from God. That is the rest offered by God to us today. It's not about a particular day of the week, although that is still a gift from God and we should take that. It's not about a particular plot of land, though I believe Israel should occupy that land because God gave it to them as their rest But all of those things were leading up to something much more spiritual. It's it's a spiritual reality that God was preparing his people for throughout the Old Testament by giving them the Sabbath day, by giving them the Sabbath land. It's here in verses 9 and 10 of Hebrews 4. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God has rested from his works. Ah, how often do we see our religion, our religious duty, our connection with God as just a bunch of work, that I have to get this done, I have to get this done, I can't do this, I gotta be a better father, I gotta be a better husband, I gotta be a better citizen, I I, I have to do, 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 and those chocolates keep coming and keep coming, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with these things. Shoving them down my shirt. In my hat, I'm shoving him in my mouth. God offered to you and I a rest, a model of rest by these Old Testament examples. But instead of ceasing from physical labor, the author is encouraging his audience to cease from the pressure of having to do it all on your own. 
So the particular Sabbath rest that we read of in Hebrews 4 is not a day of a week. It's not a plot of land. It is a continual reliance on the work of Jesus for our justification, our sanctification, and our glorification. This is what Jesus meant in Matthew 11. Come to me. He's speaking to a people who were under the law, many of whom were as crazy busy and trying to be good enough for God as we saw in that clip. Realizing how weary that makes one. Realizing how soul-crushing that life can be. Jesus gives them insight into what God really wants of them when it comes to obedience. Because God still calls us into obedience. Come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now to understand this, you need to know what a yoke is. Well, it's the yellow part of an egg. I'm kidding. A yoke is a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the neck of two animals and then is attached to a plow or to a cart that those animals are to pull. Now, Jesus is comparing the yoke that the religious leaders of his day were putting on people. That was a heavy yoke. Uh, It was an oppressive list of do's and don'ts. Uh, They they took 10 commandments and they made 360 of them. Literally. It's like 36 rules for every one to to explain these 10, right? Um, They they didn't want anybody to to step out of line. And... uh, Jesus is saying, that's the kind of yoke that the religious people have put on you. I'm giving you a relatively easy yoke of righteousness that doesn't come from uh, stone tablets and you have to, to read these and do these here. But I want to put them on your heart to have righteousness come from here much, much easier. Jesus is condemning the Jewish leaders for putting unrealistic expectations on the people. What he was offering to them was different. Now, please note, it's still a yoke. It's still a yoke. Well, I started thinking about this. We really do have to find a tightrope, don't we? Because I know some people who say, oh, it's on me. I've got to do it all. I've got to, I've got to make sure I obey everything and don't break any rule at all. And then you get some people say, hey, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. You've got to find a balance in the middle here. And there is tension there. Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy, but it's still a yoke. Not a heavy yoke, but it's, it still connects us to Jesus. This was my aha this week. Oh, I got so excited about this. God showed me this. When you put on a yoke, and it's Jesus' yoke, who is tied to you? Jesus. So now that God says, I want you to walk in righteousness, put this yoke on you, you have Jesus right beside you. You're putting on his yoke. You are choosing to follow Jesus. And now, once you put that yoke on, wherever he goes, guess where you go? You're yoked to him. It's not on you, though. No longer do you have to carry the burden. Man, he, he, it's, it's like if you're weary and you don't want to drive anymore, and the person that you are traveling with, they know where they're going. You say, why don't you drive? I'm going to sit here and let you drive. I'm still going where you're going, but you're doing the work. That's what the yoke is all about when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Because then if I put his yoke on me, then wherever he goes, because I am yoked to him, that's where I will go to. On his power, not mine. See, that's how a yoke can be easy because it's no longer on us to to say, hey, we're going to go this way. Jesus goes, no, we're going to go this way. So guess where you're going to go? You're going to go this way. And now we're going to turn to go this way. Oh, okay, now I'm going to go that way. And so then my life reflects the righteousness of God, not because I can do it on my own, but because I've chosen to connect myself to Jesus. He's the strong one. So this is the conclusion that the author then makes in Hebrews 4.11. Then let us therefore strive to enter into that rest. Wouldn't that be so much better in our Christianity? To rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to change us, to lead us. So that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Not striving to earn our way in, but striving to go where Jesus 
leads us. DC, now that you're back in, why don't you come and bring your, your team on up? I, I was a little nervous. I had to kind of stretch it out going, oh my goodness, there's, there goes my worship leader. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll add two more pages to the, uh, to the sermon. One last thing to bring to us this morning by way of encouragement. There's one last reality of a Sabbath rest mentioned in Scripture, by the way. It's the eternal rest. The eternal rest waiting for you and I when we leave this plane of reality and go into the next life. Revelation chapter 21, in there we read of the absence of death and crying and pain. It's a time that God wipes away all tears from our eyes. It is that inexpressibly joyful experience when, as we read of in Revelation 21.3, behold, behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. You know, we're rounding into the uh, Christmas season, and once again, our amazing uh, Christmas decoration team has done an amazing job to make this place look festive. Beginning next week, we will be singing Christmas songs and focusing on the, on the Advent reading, and so it's, it's here. But even as we prepare, as we sign off for Hebrews just for about five weeks, it's cool that this week we actually see the meaning behind one of the songs that uh, we hear around Christmas time. God rests ye merry gentlemen. By the way, notice where the comma is. We're not talking to merry gentlemen. Everybody thinks it's God rest ye, merry gentlemen. No, 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 no. The phrase is God rest ye merry. And they're talking to humanity, gentlemen. They're, because you cannot be joyful without Jesus coming into your life. So this is the good news. God rest ye merry. Meaning that God, by sending Jesus into this world, whenever it was, whether it was March 25th or December 25th, whenever it was, we rejoice that he comes into this world. Because God is giving us this joyous break where we get to rely now on his son, not on our own self for our righteousness. So today, today if you hear that offer to enter into his rest, to rely on Jesus for your salvation, both your justification, your sanctification, the ongoing process, and then finally getting into heaven, your glorification, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. So if you were wondering what you should ask for for Christmas this year, why don't you ask for a yoke? Just to remind you, just to remind you what Jesus wants you to do. He says, take my yoke upon you. You'll receive the kind of rest that you have been craving for. God wants to rest you, Mary, gentlemen and ladies, to bring eternal joy as you trust him. For then nothing shall dismay or prevent you from receiving the best gift possible. I love you guys. I love serving as your pastor, and I want to pray for us, and then we're going to close with one more song, and you are dismissed. God, thank you so much for giving us this, uh, this encouragement that, God, you, you want to give us a gift of rest. Forgive us when we try to take our own righteousness on our own responsibility. God, help us put your yoke on so that we can see that it is easy, but we also know that wherever you want us to go, then we can just be tied to you, and that's where we'll go. God, for those who are struggling today uh, as they're entering into a time of the holidays and, and uh, it's not a joyous time for them, God, at least show them the eternal hope that they have can be their joy to know that they're not walking through these struggles alone because they have been reconnected with you by the blood of Jesus and by the power of his resurrection. So God, thank you that you have rested us, Mary. We receive that gift today as we follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. So Trey, did anybody talk about Operation Christmas Child today? Uh, no. Well, Why don't you? Why don't I? I Is did that... a, a quick calculation out there this morning. And if you see Jeannie, she kind of takes the head on this. And there are over a thousand over a thousand of those little boxes that uh, it's a thousand children that are going to get served and and uh, i just thank again this uh, we're, we're singing give thanks we give thanks to god for so many things um, and this is another thing to give thanks for would you please stand with us
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, Great Thanksgiving, a great week out there, everybody. Some glad morning when this life is over.